This material has been reproduced and communicated to you by or on behalf of the Australian National University in accordance with Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. The material in this communication may be subject to copyright under the Act. Any further reproduction or communication of this material by you must be consistent with the provisions of the Act. Do not reproduce this material. Do not remove this notice. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry, we'll so this week, we change our PRAC um, activities a little bit. So far, we've been on campus, and in particular last week, we were in the Robertson building. Um, everybody seemed to find that pretty well. So um, now that you've settled into finding that, we're going to go somewhere else. <laughs> All right. We're going out to the field this week. We're going up to Gallimbarri Black Mountain. Um, and we, yeah, I know, I'm pumped about it too. Um, we get there either in minibuses, if you don't have a bus or a car of your own, or you don't feel like walking, which you can do from here quite nicely, um, then you can come on a minibus with us. So those buses leave from Fennerfield Services. I know that this was in an email last night, um, but it's useful for me just to make sure that you're on top of it. Fennerfield Services, where those buses leave from, they leave from about five past the hour, so at, you know, 9.05 or 1.05, 2.05, depending on when your prac is. If you don't know where it is, um, <coughs> this time last year my office was there, um, but you see there's the Fenner School there, there's the Fenner Building. Next to it, the rectangular blob, there's the Forestry Building with my office in there. Then this one along the yellow one is the Robertson Building, the, the lab we are in last week was pretty much where the laser pointer is sitting in, just near the cursor there. Um, now, where it says John Yenkin Building, that's where the Fenner Field Services Depot really, really is. But don't go to the building, I'll go to a satellite view. So rather than going to that John Yenkin building or around the front of building 45 where there is a sign that says Fenner Field Services. Go around the back, don't approach from the Hancock Library side because the gate's closed and the, the crane operators have their cars parked in there at the moment anyway, but there's a gate there that's always closed. Come around the other side from the Robertson building side and you'll see that there are, uh, let's say five, six, minivans in there, Toyota Hiass is in there. And that's where, where we're leaving from, if we leave from campus or if you're coming with us from campus. If you're meeting us on, you know, um, at, at a meeting site uh, on Gallimbarri Black Mountain itself, um, just have a look at my email about where you need to be for the individual prac times because there are two locations that we start from. Most of the pracs take off from a power substation up behind CSIRO on Frith Row. And there are instructions on how to get there and a little map with an arrow of how to get there. It doesn't take long to get there. You can, you can drive, of course. The walk, if you want to walk from here, and you know, you, you'll be, and you have left enough time, bearing in mind it'll probably take, oh, look at my take from, Burton and Garren College, it might take 15 minutes to walk there. But that's from Burton and Garren, not from this side of campus or, or anywhere else. So 15, 20 minutes to walk there. To get there from Burton and Garren, you just walk up the main road that goes through CSIRO and then, you know, I don't know, follow your phone. <laughs> It's, it's not difficult to find. You just follow the same route that everybody takes when they walk up through CSIRO to get up to, um, up to Black Mountain Gallimbury. Let me just show you, because I'm just sort of motioning with my hand, which way you would go and where you'd stop. So down the bottom here, you can see there's Burton and Garren. And from Burton and Garrett, you just cross, cross Clooney's Ross. You can go up 
this little south road up here, or you go up the main road up through CSIRO, you just walk up, 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 and you get up to where there's a CSIRO childcare up here, and there's also the soils library that CSIRO had sitting there. And you walk up past that, you can go through this little car park, you walk behind, there's a you know, little dirt track walks up there, and here is Frith Road, and there's the power substation sitting right here. And we'll, we'll be parking there. Now you don't have to walk there on your own if you don't want to. Uh, you can come on the bus, as I've said, or you can drive, you can get there yourself. Perfectly fine. If you go there on your own, or even if you come with us, and you're coming back to campus afterwards, when you finish the plot work that you are doing on Black Mountain, when your group finishes, you, you're, you're free to go if you have your own way from there. And if we're meeting at Frith Road, then you, you know, you, as I say, 10, 15 minutes walk downhill, it's like 10 minutes. So you, you're free to go after, after that. So it's up to you how you, you manage that. Of course, if you're off campus, this is going to save you having to find parking on campus if this is all that you have on tomorrow. So with respect to going out to Black Mountain, though, um, the um, demonstrators this morning reminded me to, to really uh, remind you of this. And again, it was in my email last night. We, we are going out into some bush. And it is, if you have, up until this point in time, and it may not be true for any of you, but perhaps if you have, up until this point in time, not walked off track in any bush or anywhere, Bear in mind that we are not walking on a track the entire time. We will walk on a fire access road or a walking track to a point and then we are taking off into the scrub. That means, as I said in my email, it's spiky, it's stony, there are insects, it's sunny, it's hot, it's dirty, it's, you know, it's all those things, right? Oh, that is really, all those great things about doing field work. Um, so just bear that in mind when you're making your, um, your clothing choices in the morning. Don't come with Birkenstocks on or thongs or sandals, anything that leaves your feet exposed and open. Just have, I'm not after like steel cap boots or anything, just have some closed shoes on. Um, because there's plenty of understory. It's pretty dry up there this time, so the understory is a bit beaten down, but it also makes it a bit bit harder, drier, spikier. So closed shoes, and and I never actually go out on field work, and I was entertaining the idea of doing so uh, only a week ago, and then I thought, what the hell am I thinking? I never go out and do field work in shorts. Um, only occasionally do I go out in shorts on field work, but I have gaiters then that come up to my knees. And that's not because I'm paranoid about snakes, but they are there. But also because, you know, uh, this might be hard to believe of an academic, I'm a bit of a, like, klutz at times. <laughs> I'm looking at this tree over there and thinking about that species and look at this, a rossi Idivis hybrid and before I know it I'm lying on the ground. Right? And I'm walking into things. And there's plenty of stuff to walk into, spike and so on. So if you have longer pants that you're going to wear, great. If you, if you don't, then fine, but just be aware that you, you might come away with a couple of scratches on your legs, and that's pretty normal when it comes to field work. So just bear that in mind. Also, it's going to be hot tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, so 30, 31, 30. Maybe you don't think that's hot, but that's hot enough when you're out in the field, especially in the afternoons, and even more so if you're lucky and you end up on a north, one of Pukenmore's north-facing aspects. It, it gets quite warm on those aspects. And, and you get to really experience, you know, what species patterning is about when you're on the north as opposed to south. <coughs> Maybe wear a, a shirt rather than just, I don't know, a singlet or something, unless you're, you're, you really want to want to get roasted. Um, and a hat, something to drink, definitely bring water with you. And if you need food, bring food. If you don't need food, bring food. <laughs> Just have something, because if you haven't done field work before, this is not intense, hard field work from, I guess, as field work goes, but you're out there, you're doing physical stuff, and every so often you just, maybe you just need to sit down on an apple or something. 
Does anyone have any questions about? Yeah. Sorry, if Thursday afternoons. Yeah. Thursday afternoons go two till five, don't they? Yeah, it just sorry. That just clarifies it says one. Do you know what? Sorry, if okay, I'll clarify that in an email to everyone. It, Thursdays run two till five, sorry. I'll fix that. Yeah. So the regular time for Thursday afternoon pracs. Thanks. I'll fix that. Any other yeah? Okay, so, so if you didn't hear that, and, and maybe for people who listen afterwards it's important to repeat, if you have a commitment on after the prank and you're concerned about getting back, yes, you can go to a different prank time, but it, it really makes things really difficult, especially if you, and you don't necessarily have eyes across how many people there are across some of the pranks, and some of the pranks we're, we're really overloaded. Um, so it's better to stay with that prank time, but just make sure that I know right at, from the outset that you've got a time pressure at the other end. We aim to be back here so that anyone with commitments on immediately afterwards, they're back here in time. But also bear in mind that generally the, pro, the, the plot work, the prac work that you're doing, can be done pretty quickly. You just sort of, in a way, you need to organise yourselves as a, as a group as you're doing it. And I'll point that out to you in ways that you can make it quick. But also, in your group, you are able to, if the group is done, you are able to leave once you've completed that plot work. Or within your group, you, you also need to, if you individually need to be back and, you know, you've got a, a really tight time pressure, you need to be back here at quarter two and it looks like we'll be back at ten two, you'll need to discuss that with your group partners and say, look, I, I've got to be back here, can we hurry it up? Or I'm going to have to leave here at this time and, and leave you guys, you know, carrying the rest of it. But we aim to be back in time so that if you've got something on at, you know, 12 o'clock and you're on a morning session, then you're here in time. But we're all, we're all kind of, we all have to work together on that. So it is nice to go out there and look at the trees. Oh, we've got to, and I have to sort of keep what I'm saying in brief too. Any other questions or things you want to clarify? Um, I will again mention trees over our heads snakes and other things when we get out there but if you're concerned in particular about snakes I'm not going to lie to you yes there are all right we don't see them a lot but last year there there was a brown snake on one of the transects right they tend to move off pretty quickly I am always the first or one of your demonstrators is we're always the first people through and we always have gaiters on if you want a pair of gaiters right first step is Socks. <laughs> Next step is long pants. Step after that is maybe a pair of gaiters over the top. If you want a pair of gaiters, because you're concerned. Gaiters. Gaiters are these little sort of canvassy, sort of uh, thicker fabrics or things that come up over over your ankles. Pretty much, and your eyes open. The vast majority of snake bites occur from here to here. Why does that happen? Because people mess with them when they shouldn't. Right? If you see a snake, don't mess with it. And the vast majority of snake bites, are, that's, that's it. Right? But we have gators, you can borrow them. Right? You mightn't like the look, but you know, what else? You're in the bush. At the prac, I'll have a box of them. Yeah. They mightn't be the colour you like, they're all black. <laughs> Some of them are green, but that's, that's it. All right? But I, I don't want to dress it up. I don't want to make it worse than it sounds. We see them from time to time. They move away quickly. But I will say you are more likely to see a snake here on campus or at the Botanic Gardens than you are on Black Mountain. Principally because we will be walking through the scrub. We walk slowly. We are big, awkward, lumbering beasts in comparison to a snake and they have plenty of time to get out of the way when we're walking through the scrub. It's only on quite cold mornings and in sheltered places and that's why we saw one last year. It was quite cold last year. Right? 
right? But here on campus, you're more likely to see them out the front of a little pickle than you are on Black Mountain. And, and I've seen them there a few times. So. <laughs> now you're going to be wearing gaiters when you go for coffee. <laughs> All right, OK. No other questions? I haven't made you scared because there's nothing to be scared of, really. That silence is actually, why don't you tell me that? Yeah, just keep your eyes open. Yeah. But if you are concerned about anything when we get there, just talk to me about it and, and we'll, we'll work with that, okay? All right, so let's get on and talk about non-PRAC things because PRACs give us data and we've been working with data. Now, I just want to just remind you where we're up to. Last week we spent quite a bit of time thinking and talking about error. In particular, in the PRAC, a good portion of the PRAC was about error. Remember, I spoke about error in different forms, um, measurement-based error. We talked about intrinsic population error and the contributions those components of error make to the data sets that we have. I did also mention that there, were, there is sampling error as well, and we didn't touch on much when it came to sampling error, except in the second lecture to illustrate points when sampling error contributes to completely spurious outcomes insofar as what we take away from our data. And I showed examples of toilet paper, alluded to an example of insurance commercials, uh, American war lotteries, but in research, you know, all those things might seem completely irrelevant compared to, to research perhaps, but those elements play out in research too. And in this week's quiz in particular, there is a question two questions that focus on sampling error in particular. One of them relates to assumptions around outbreaks or the way that jellyfish appear to be taking over the oceans and the way that inference was driven there. And the other is focused on Cook and Edwards' paper. And we'll talk a bit more about that paper when we're in the field. But a reminder of this is where we got up to last week around definitions and ideas of error. Now remember in the prac and in the lecture we covered histograms, we talked about histograms and that way we use histograms not as just a data display but to interrogate data a little bit and in the online lesson there was a bit of discussion around box and whisker ports, definitions of outliers. So that's where we get to at the end of last week and now we get to this point where we are left with one really big implication associated with two elements of error in our data set. Putting aside measurement error, because remember last week I said we make an assumption that our measurements are free of error, or at least we have error that is definable. We, it's knowable in some way, and we have some way of recognising and dealing with it. We have these remaining forms of error. The really big one that we talked about last week was intrinsic error. Now before we go on, let's just see so that we are completely clear on intrinsic error. Here is a representation of the trees on, uh, in the blue gum stand. Now here I have summarised the data down to just one observation per tree and its diameter measurement. Now this is taken from the reference data set in the comparison data that you worked with last week. And you can see in here, it's a shame it's down a bit low, but you can see in here the distribution of diameters across that stand. You can see the, the bulk of them sit down there in the 30 to 50 range, and then there are a couple that are, are really up there in the 80 to 100 centimetre kind of range. And that is our representation, the embodiment, if you like, of intrinsic population error. We have a population of trees there, all of them measured, and we can see that they differ in size. There's nothing surprising. We have some big trees, they tend to sit on the edge, edge effects associated with trees, so if we rather conveniently walked up to the stand and just sampled trees on the edge, we'd end up with the impression that the trees are much bigger than they might otherwise be. Or we went to a particular spot where the trees were all tightly growing next to each other, we'd probably end up with a bunch of trees sitting down on this bottom end, smaller trees. So convenience or non-representative samples can lead to 
inappropriate or spurious estimates of population value. So if we use an edge tree based uh, set of data to estimate mean diameter, that would overestimate our diameters. If we used a dense little section of the stand to estimate diameter, that would lead to an underestimate or a negative bias. The fact that we have this intrinsic population error means that regardless of what we're measuring, people, plants, animals, regardless of what we're asking of those objects, we're asking them questions or we're just measuring them or whatever we're doing, maybe we're just counting them, we need to recognise that this intrinsic error is going to be present within our data, but more importantly, as I introduced in the second lecture last, le last week, that if we sample, our sample estimate will be impacted by the individuals that fall within the sample. Those individuals are characterised by intrinsic error. As a consequence, any estimate we derive using a sample will likely deviate. Maybe we have a mean diameter or something. We'll likely deviate, will almost definitely deviate from the true population parameter, the true mean, the true count, the true weight, the true whatever. Sampling will deliver that outcome in almost every single, every single time we apply sampling because intrinsic population error exists. And we cannot know how an individual will vary because it's one of these random, what we might refer to as a stochastic process within our data. Sampling error is a consequence of intrinsic population error. It is a consequence of the intersection of the need to sample and intrinsic population error. And it is the need for us to sample rather than census entire populations that gives rise to the need for us to make inferences about populations from a sample. So inference is that. It is applying sample-based descriptive statistics, the sort of things that we'll talk about in a moment, the sort of, we collect some data, we summarise our data, and then we use those descriptive statistics that apply to those data to say something about the population, to infer population parameters from our sample measurements. And it is an absolutely necessary step not just in research but in daily life because we cannot possibly sample all possible, we can't measure all possible outcomes associated with trees, people, experiences, daily life. We must sample. Yeah. So we must now draw inference. Now the way that we do that presents a problem. How do we do that when we know there's an underlying source of error within a population, can we just, you know, make a single point estimation of a, of a mean or a count and can we then say, well, that's representative? Well, no, no we can't, right? There, there's likely, as I've just said, likely that there'll be some difference between our sample and our population values. But Let's bear in mind that there are two ways we can estimate them. We can, we can have a point estimation, and that point estimation, because of intrinsic error, can only estimate where a population value might be, somewhere. Here is my current estimate of a population estimate, here based upon this point. And it is just that. It's a single point that fixes the population, perhaps, in space. Now, because of our intrinsic error, that that value might deviate substantially from the population mean. And if we want to find some way of making that point estimate representative of the population mean, we need to come up th with then some way of sampling that is going to mean that our sample is, is actually representative. So we go back to what I was saying in the lecture last week around the three principles of sampling. Now, if we want to truly make an inference about a population, what we need to do then is to step 
beyond a simple point-based estimate of a population parameter. We need to broaden this. Very literally, we need to broaden things. To make a population inference, we have to step away from a point estimate and generate an interval estimate. Acknowledging that there is intrinsic error in my population, acknowledging that sampling error arises because of it, I no longer think that this is my population value, one single point in data space, but I recognise that in the presence of that uncertainty, there's a, there's a range within which it might sit. There's an interval. And so I can, and we will, be estimating based upon an interval. And that interval estimate, interval estimates are needed then to be able to say something about a population, to respond to, again, this presence of intrinsic error. Now, to be, as it indicates up there, to be useful, really, we need to be able to say, not only, I reckon, the population value is in this range, in this interval. I don't just reckon that. I think that to this level of certainty, the population value is in there. So I need to be able to make a statement about how certain I am, how likely it is, that a population value will sit in a particular interval. So that when I say that, you can then say something to you about the likely value to a specific level of confidence. You can then look at that and say, okay, I'm, I accept that level of confidence and I can work with that. And within research, we, we generally have an agreed level of certainty that we work to. We'll come back to that. So the question is, how, how do we do that? Now, in this course, we'll spend a good portion of next week and a little bit of this week addressing the concept behind how we do that. But let's step back from that for a moment because to do that, you remember if I just come back here, to do that we need to first of all apply anything that we say about a population, we need to apply it based upon our descriptive statistics. We need to describe our sample first, then use our sample description to make inferences about a population. So let's step back to that component and let's get that out of the way first. Let's cover some territory that will be incredibly dull <laughs> because you've no doubt done this before and you know what a mean and a standard deviation is. But I want to cover this because especially the standard deviation, and especially too, if you're not comfortable with statistical notation, it is worth seeing at this point, so that we can progressively build something, especially when it comes to the summer squares. All right, so if we were to make a point estimate about a population value, a typical, the typical, the most common point estimate that we use is the mean. So an arithmetic average, you know, you sum all of the values together, you divide them by the number of observations there are, and you have the mean. Now the way that we notate that in our equations from here on is in two possible ways. We have mu and x bar. Mu refers to, if we're talking about a population, the population mean, mu. And we estimate the population mean with a sample-based mean, x bar. Any bar on top there indicates the mean of what is underneath. X indicates our observations, our x variable, and the mean of that. Okay, so we have x bar. Now, you can read about the appropriateness of it for quantitative data, and I'm sure the no, the lesson online covers some of this because I know it covers the median and so on as well. But what I want to highlight just before we move on is this content on the right hand side. If this is the kind of thing that wigs you out, we sort of start building it from here and we don't get too much more complicated than this and what you see in this lecture. There's variations on, it, on these but not much more than this. As I've just highlighted, x bar, 
the mean of the observations, and, and it's typically referred to as x, unless, of course, we have fitted a graph where we have an x and a y, we might refer to y bar as well. So we might have an x and a y. And we'll see that when we talk correlation later in the semester. We have this summation operator here. We've got sigma. So that indicates that we just sum anything that comes afterwards. The reason I'm going through this, which might seem painful, is because I suspect that you know how to calculate the average of, a, of two or three things, right? And you already know that. So if I just ex explain the notation associated with what you already know, there's a little bridge connected if, you, if you're not comfortable with this notation. All right, so we've got the sum of x subscript i. So we have these individual observations of the independent values of x. So that means that I have one measurement of x and it doesn't affect a measurement that I have from another or organism over there. It's not always true, but that's a completely different level of stats, right? Let's not <laughs> worry about that at this point. And then we divide it by n. Now, in this case, small n. Big n, population. Number of individuals or observations in a population, small n, number in a sample. Now, so that gives us our point. Now, if we were trying to describe our data using a point and an interval, so we not only have its central point, but we describe the variability within the data, so we also now have the standard deviation. Now again, you no doubt have seen the standard deviation before. You have a sense of it capturing some notion of the, not quite, but kind of average variation or deviation between each value and the overall mean of a data set, all right? And that is, in essence, what it captures. But it's worth taking a moment and looking at the components in here and thinking about them because there are two important elements that we will be cycling around again and again, especially when it comes to the analysis of variance or ANOVA. And if you haven't seen the ANOVA before, having a grounding in N minus 1 and this component over here, what is referred to as the sum of squared deviates, it's like going hiking, right? Every feature on a map has a name. Every feature of this equation also has a name. It's worth understanding these components. So first, let's have a look at the way that it comes, comes together. First, we have the deviant. It's not some character that you see at the bus stop or something. It's like an actual calculation. So the deviant is the difference between the individual independent observations of X and their mean. So each one of them. And you, in a standard deviation calculation, but also in variance, because this is the variance equation as well, also when it comes to analysis of variance. We, we base our calculations on this component. And what we do, we calculate the individual deviances and we sum them all together. The sum of n observations, n individual observations, independent observations, equally weighted from 1 through to n. Now, we don't just sum those deviates, we square them. And that gives us what we term the sum of squared deviates or the sum of squares, often abbreviated, as you can see there, to SS. The sum of squared deviates. The reason for summing, oh, sorry, for squaring them, and just bear in mind there's a variation on this, but I'll come to that. The reason for squaring them calculate the deviates within a data set of three numbers, one, two, three, and you calculate... Sorry? Exactly. So we have negative, positive numbers, and because you've calculated the mean and you're calculating the deviation of each value from that and then summing them, you have a zero-sum problem. The sum of deviates will always equal zero. That's perhaps obvious, or maybe you're like, wow, that's great. <laughs> Either way, we need a solution to that. And one solution to it is that we square that term. And so it turns every deviate into a positive, but it also weights larger deviates 
proportionately larger than it does smaller deviants. So we sum the squared deviants. And then we divide by what we term the degrees of freedom, df. Now, there is another way of representing that equation, and you can see I've just sort of presented that just here. You know, n minus 1 with the sum of square deviates on top rather than represented on, in the above calculation. So a question here is what does that degrees of freedom term actually represent? For example, why is it n minus 1? If we were trying to express the, you know, the kind of difference between each observation and the sample mean, surely we just divide it by n. I mean, we just saw the mean before. That's what you do. But we don't here. We divide it by n minus 1. Now, now, why is that? Now, before we get to that point, let's just appreciate that at this point, this function represents the variance. And when we talk about deviation in a set of data, variance is in statistical calculations, that's where we stop. We don't calculate standard deviation. We leave it here. And that's what we use for the analysis of variance, not surprisingly. But there is a relation between them, so you can see that it's just the square of the standard deviation. Now, why is df n minus 1? Now, there are a couple of things to appreciate here. One, it is only n minus 1 if we are calculating the standard deviation for a sample. If we're talking about a population, we divide by big N. So in that case, it actually becomes the average squared deviant. But in this case, that's, that's not what happens. The reason for it, first of all, and when you think about the term degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom represent the number of ways in which our data are free to vary. Let's imagine for a moment we have a data set, again, composed of a small number of, of observations, maybe three, four numbers, and we calculate a mean for those three, four numbers. And then afterwards, we're presented with a list of three of those numbers plus the mean of the, the four that we've just calculated. We can, because we have the mean, we can derive, we can back calculate what the missing value that we don't know we can back calculate what that was. So there is one number, one observation that is not free to vary. It does not have any degree of freedom. We have defined a data point, we, you know, we don't define which data point it is, but we know that we can define a single data point based upon the fact that we have included a mean within our function already. The inclusion of a mean diminishes the degrees of freedom by which our data set can now vary. We need to explicitly recognise that. Now, why, why does that matter? Well, because universally, if we put n underneath here and only use n, within a sample, a sample standard deviation calculated using n will always, almost always, it's very rare that it doesn't happen, will almost always underestimate standard deviation. Because when we sample, because of this thing that we'll come to appreciate as central tendency, it is more likely that we will end up with a value that is close to the mean than far away. We tend not to get data sets that are really widely spread as far as a data set can be. We tend to underestimate standard deviation. And that correction, has been for decades, for more than decades now, recognised as the correction to account for that, regardless of the data set, regardless of the size, regardless of what it is that you're measuring. In part because it explicitly recognises the impact of including a mean in the calculation. Why do I talk about degrees of freedom so much? Because it really matters later. Because the more means we bring into a calculation, the more we can constrict our variance, the more we constrict the observations that are present within a data set. So we need to recognise at this point that this is an important step. And then we take the square root of that and we've got the standard deviation. 
That's not the key part. The square root here is really only to return the calculation to the same units, same scale that the original measurements were made in. That's all that that part's doing. There's nothing mysterious about it. The two key parts there, n minus 1 and the sum of square deviates. Those are two useful things to hold on to because we'll see them again and again. And we apply the sum of square deviates and the degrees of freedom in different ways depending on the analysis. All right, so if we have our sample data, and here's a lovely shot of an area on Black Mountain that we maybe will see towards the end of the semester, we have these two descriptive statistics. Some people call them the first and the second moments. We have the mean and the standard deviation. For a sample, the standard deviation given to us by S. And they become our the basis for our point and interval estimates. They then become the basis for our population inference. Our descriptive statistics now are applied at a, at a sample level to describe the population. So now we come back to how. How do we, how do we arrive at this point where we can use our sample data to estimate a population, knowing that there's this intrinsic error and knowing that your one sample of 10 trees is conducted perhaps once on its own in the absence of any other resampling of, blue, of the blue gum stand. That resampling that you did is a very unusual circumstance. That's not something we typically do in research. We don't have the time or the money um, to do that. So let's try to answer that question by having a look at the blue gum data, if it's such a, a special data set. And, it, and really, in a way, this is what that data set is truly for. Now here, I have the comparison data. Now to make this a little bit easier to sort of come out and to recognise, that there are three different forms of error, sampling, intrinsic, and measurement error. I've tried here to stabilize that measurement error. Remember, you saw in the prac, you saw some measurement error associated with whether you measured circumference or diameter, whether you started the tape right at the start or you actually started measuring at zero. So there are those sources of measurement error. Now, I here have eliminated all, that, all those sources of error. And I have included, for each of you as observers, for each of you and the trees that you each measured, the reference data for each of those trees. So we have many, many observations in here. If you were to calculate a mean of all of them, let's go down to the bottom, 135. There we go, 214. That means <coughs> that means about 50 people didn't do it. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> All right, so we have 214 observers here, each ideally with 10 trees. I know some of you have duplicates, so you have maybe eight or nine. All right, but let's say, let's try to understand what we can do with an individual sample by looking across all of these 214 samples. What happens if we do have the opportunity to resample over and over and over? And what can it tell us about how we might go about sampling and how we might be able to make a population inference? The first thing to remember at this point is that our sampling was conducted randomly. So I did not ask you to go up there and select 10 trees to measure. I gave you those 10 trees. And I gave you those 10 trees based upon a random number generator that then operated with a lookup function in Excel and just found the first nearest number it could find that was a tree. So there are two, one definite random process, although if you know a bit about Excel, you know that it's actually not truly random. It's based on the system clock and Anyway, it's random enough because it is a randomising process. It's independent of the trees at 
and blue gum. I don't think that Microsoft has any awareness of blue gum on, on ANU campus, right? So we can see those things as independent ran or a randomising process that we've thrown in there. Then on top of that, the way that the function was operated. So it's less about random and more about randomising. All right, so I gave you that. So you had an independently assigned random number set. You went and measured them. So let's look at the, and I'm doing this in Excel for a couple of reasons. One, so you can see it happen in Excel, but also because there's, there's no JMP on this machine. It's a little bit faster in JMP. But last week we made use of pivot tables. So remember I showed you pivot tables and I said, what if I wanted you to calculate the average of you know, diameter across different dominance classes? Well, this, is, this will be even more time consuming. Quickly calculate the average diameter across all 214 observers, right? This is when a pivot table becomes particularly helpful. Right, so as in the prior, click once in there. Click, okay, it's automatically selected. I don't like the way that it does this, but anyway. All right, <coughs> new sheet. Now there's a, a funny row label in there. But anyway, we won't worry about it right now. All right, so what I want to do, I want to have observer in one over here in the rows. All right, so I have my 214 observers, and then I want to have DBH, but I don't want to count. Like we agreed on, or you know, we didn't agree. I just said. <laughs> All right, we want an average. Now it doesn't call it the mean here. Bear in mind that you know, if we really want to be, I'm not going to say pedantic about it, but if we want to be really clearly, clearly defined in this case. We shouldn't be calling it the average. Why? Because there are different averages. Right? This is an arithmetic average, it's the mean. There are geometric averages, there are harmonic means. Anyway, we'll move on. Right. So now I have all of these averages that are all based upon eight, ten trees. And if I scroll down to the bottom, it doesn't calculate an average because there must be a weird value in there somewhere. There it is. Observer 113. Let's, let's just turn Observer 113 off for the time being. <laughs> now I don't know how to get rid of that one. Filter. Must be right. There we go. All right, 113. So you shouldn't work with children and animals. Now add live data to that. <laughs> Come on. There we go. So that's fixed that table. So now we have the average of the averages. So each plot has an average, each sample has an average, and the average of those averages is 49.7. Now we'll come back and look at the data just now. We'll see what are what are the what is the actual average of the data set? But before we do that, a question to ask at this point is, what do you think the distribution of those averages is going to look like? Is it going to look like the original data set? You think so? Okay, so the distribution of our sample means, so our sampling distribution, not a sample distribution, the sampling distribution will look like or won't look like the distribution of the population itself. Let's answer that in two hours. Let's maybe think on, does it look like it? No, why wouldn't it? It does look like it. Why? Because it matters what happens next. This is like a to be this is like the first to be continued I've ever, <laughs> I've ever given. 